Now it's a real privilege and a real blessing to speak to us the final night. I think as I look back from night to night as he's brought the messages, the thing that has struck home back that as he's presented to us of the Christians seeking after God and not being satisfied with any exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are privileged again to hear this opportunity to hear our brother Tozer to us the word. The Lord bless you, brother Tozer, and I'm minister. Sure now that I've been here and met some very good people, and I'll know them always. And won't have to be introduced to them when we meet on that fair shore, if indeed we are. That's something I haven't figured out. But anyway, I know him now, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be here this week. And I uh, was forced to make a choice whether I should bring something that please and comfort you, or whether to bring an evangelistic message that my kind of action may be on some people's part, and I chose the latter. I think it was Dr. Paul Reese that said that parts to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. And there are times when we might as well as comfort the afflicted. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, is there. Stir up the grace of God that is in you, that's there. So I want to talk tonight about the evils of pumped living. And uh, in the 24th chapter of the Acts, of Paul had preached a sermon, and uh, Felix had heard it. Felix heard these things, it says in the 22nd verse. When Felix had heard a more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him. After certain days, and Felix came down with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as Paul reasoned, righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season. I will call for it. He hoped also, and that word also indicates there were mixed motives in what this man was doing. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore he sent oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, which is to say that he succeeded him in his political position. And Felix, willing to show the Jews pleasure, left Paul bound. Now we have here a man who knows the truth, he wants to hear about it, is making appointments to hear about it again, is frightened by the preaching, is so covetous he'd like to make a bit of money on it, it for political reasons of displeasing certain elements in the citizenry. But the thing is, after two years, Paul was still bound and Felix was still lost. No record anywhere that Felix was ever saved. Now, there is a great insistent fact that we have to deal with, a great imperative that commands attention, that uh, bears down upon our interests, and we will, will it will be heard. 
the most important fact in the world is that Christ has come, that God has sent his son Jesus Christ into the world, knocks at every man's door, and that he commands all men everywhere to repent, and that we, before we owe any obligation to our family, before we owe any obligation to our country, before any obligation to anyone in this world obliged to deal with this first great, all-comprehensive, imperative, insistent fact that God has sent his Son into the world, that he commands all men to repent and believe on his Son. And until we have settled that, we have not yet settle the most important problems that face us. Now, contrary to what some would have it, the truth that bears down on us embraces not only the gospel that Christ died to just for the unjust, but it embraces righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. That uh, the Christianity, the message of Christ, is more than that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, as Paul defines it, part of it, and that's central in it. But there is more than that. The man, Paul, moved by the Holy Ghost, standing before Felix, preached on righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. I read one time a little piece in a magazine. You know, you, you, you're in, incredulous because you're likely to read anything. Uh, if, if you say to yourself, well, it, you, people are can't wrong, they, they will be. Somebody will be. And uh, I read a piece once where a fellow was explaining the difference between, and he said properly, that law was an external command to keep certain rules. Certain that grace was the good will of God who blessed us and gave us life without law. Now, he said there are two worlds. One is the world of law and one is the world of grace. Not by keeping law, but by grace. And I was with him that far, and still am. He went on to illustrate it. He said, for instance, if a man comes into my office and says to me, I'll to be saved. Now he says, I am a murderer. I have murdered some people. I am a murderer. And I want to be saved. I want to have eternal life. Now he said, what am I to tell that? He said, if I want to go into the world of law, I'll say to him, you shan't murder anymore. Stop murdering. But he said, if I do that, I'll be mixing law and grace. So he said, all in the wide world, I can tell that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Well, I threw that magazine away and grieved that anybody infinitely obtuse with the Bible before him. Grace doesn't operate in a man till he has repented, brethren. And we might just as well get hold of that idea now. I am saved by I am saved by grace when I have met the conditions of grace. God does not save me by grace and the end. The grace of God, which bringeth salvation, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denies and well in us we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. A Baptist pre two Baptist preachers came to me in Chicago during the Second World War. They came out to the south side to my study. And they said, we're a rescue mission downtown, and uh, we deal with hundreds of soldiers and sailors. Now, lovely, we have boys on their way out to ship out, and they know they're going out there, some of them never do. And they're scared. They're just kids, they said, they said and they're scared. And uh, we have strict rule, rules from the top that we are never to preach repentance to these boys. 
We're never to say, boys, you're going to have to begin and turn away from all known iniquity and confess your wrongdoings to the Lord and believe on complete cleansing and deliverance. We're not ever to say that. We're to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. He said, and there is that we are running through the mill of that mission, hundreds of young fellows on their way out to die, and every one of them believe, and they bow their heads and say, all right, I believe, and they go scared as they were. They said, they're not saved, not saved. They have been ground through a doctrinal mill. Now, I'd like to ask you to notice something here, my friends. One time, there was a jailer, and that jailer was scared stiff. And he was not only scared stiff, he was believed by what he had been hearing by Paul and uh, Silas, and uh, he was under the influence and the power of the Spirit of God to a point where he ran trembling and fell knees in front of Paul and asked for a light. And Paul said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, saved, for the simple reason there was nothing else to tell that man. He was already a penitent man. He was on his knees, trembling to the light. And Paul gave it to him, Believe, and thou shalt be saved. That was one instance. Here's another instance, which is quite... Here was a money-loving politician who was living in sin, and there was no repentance in him. And he impenitent and stayed over a number of years, at least that we know about, and we never know that he ever changed. And when Paul preached to him, say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, it would have been casting pearls before swine. It would have seed on solid rock. So Paul went after him where he lived. He preached to him right temperance and judgment to come. And it was that that made Felix tremble, but he didn't tremble enough. If he had fallen on his knees, trembling, and said, Paul, I repent of my sins, what am I to do? Paul would have said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If I tell an impenitent man, Believe on Christ, I am violating the New Testament, and I am offering a man a place in the kingdom of God, a sinner a place in the kingdom of God, still sinning. God within the murder and the obscene. There isn't anybody bad enough that the Lord won't save him. But the point is, him when he's through with that, if he still loves that, he can have it. He can be saved when he gets free from it. And comes in the last, uh, over the last 50 years in the United States, we have been brainwashed by a kind that's as false to the New Testament and to the teachings of the fathers as it's possible to get. And yet current as being good coin of the fundamentalist and evangelical realm. And it skips repentance, grace, and love. Of one great preacher it said, he so preached repentance as to lower the moral standards of England. Entirely possible to preach grace, grace, and continue to preach it until the man believes that he's a murderer and doesn't have to stop murdering all of you. Ah, Paul preached righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. If Jesus Christ can't make a man on earth, he can't, he can't justify him in heaven. And I'm not going to be tricked into any kind of pie-in-the-sky deal. The Lord Jesus Christ can't deliver me now from sin. I don't believe he can deliver me before the face of my Father which art in heaven. Regenerate and deliver, I don't believe he can justify. But I believe he can do both. I believe that he justifies and believe on him before the Father. I believe also that he saves those who repent and believe on him from their sins in this life. Well, here is that great fact, this imperative fact that's demanding attention, demanding attention, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And belief on Jesus Christ, a full-hearted service Christ that cries for moral action and change and amendment of life. Now everybody does something about it. Some ignore it, reject it, and some spurn it. Some surrender and accept the, the good life of Jesus Christ. 
and uh, join a church and go to work and witness and testify and seek to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Some simply admit and acknowledge, as this man did, that it's good and they want to hear more about it, but they postpone any more. Always remember that you haven't done anything about truth until you have acted on it. Truth on. If it is a statement, it is to be believed. If it is a command, it is to be obeyed. And if you have believed nor obeyed, you haven't done anything. And you've postponed action, hoping that it's some other not living. And thus you postpone your Christian life. Now that's the great beast that is never filled. Well, it's never filled. All around us we have. And uh, it's beside everybody's bed, and it's beside everybody's dining room, beside everybody's desk, it follows everybody down the street. It's that great beast that says, not now, nor let's do this. Tomorrow, tomorrow I will, and it shall be peace. And so the urgings of the Holy Spirit are, they're postponed. They are not denied and, uh, and rejected. We simply dodge out of them for convenient and uh, at a later time. Tomorrow and tomorrow all shall be well. So the word of God is not obeyed. It is rejected just as certainly as it rejected in the seminary that denies the Bible is true. A lot of people who are Bible believers and they're at the unbeliever, like Bishop Pike out here who said the Bible was a book of myths. You got into the magazines and newspapers. So the owner knows it him. But at least he was bold enough to say it. But let me tell you, there are two kinds, there are two kinds of unbelief. The unbelief that says it like that man said it. Then there's the unbelief that is too cowardly to say it but never obeys. And it proves as bad a case of unbelief as the other man. If I believe, I will do something about it. On my thing, morning or tomorrow noon, uh, somebody else, there's a bomb on there. If I believe it, I'll get off. If I don't believe it, I'll sit in. It depends upon whether I believe it or not. If I believe it, I'm going to get out of there. If I yell at night, fire you if you get out of your house. If you don't believe it, you turn over and say that drunk man's down there again. So it depends upon whether we believe a thing. And if I haven't done anything about it yet, I don't believe it savingly. Now I want to show you how I know the human mind pretty well after 60 years of fooling around in the world and reading my Bible and praying and talking. And uh, so instead of leaving this up where I've had it up to now in the realm of, uh, of uh, theory and doctrine, I want to know how this postponed living works with people. I want to show you how it works with Christians, for instance. How we will, I will, and the next day we say again, tomorrow I will. Well, tomorrow I will read that book. Some books that you haven't read, you meant to read, it, to read them. You bought that book somewhere, and you intended to read it. But it hasn't got read. It's right there on the ship. All right there. It's never any of it dropped out. It's still there. And your wife doesn't. But it's still there. And you haven't read it. It's a good book that others have told you help them to know God. Better to, to go on into the spiritual life deeper. But you haven't read it. But you tell yourself that you're going to read it. And you come home. And uh, you tell yourself, now, I'm going to read that book. And then you come home Monday evening. And there's the newspaper the old chef did. And now the Adley Stevenson's getting along over in the United Nations. And so you read that. The supper's ready, and you eat. And then there's an interesting program on, and you look at that. And uh, then that prolonged, there's another interesting one comes along. And then you stretch and yawn, and by that time I've had a hard day. And you disappear, but not to read the book but to go to bed. So you haven't read the book, and that's the next time. Next summer I'll read that book. When I, when I have time next summer, you take a long trip into California or Canada, and uh, you don't have any time to read the book. You don't even take it long. And here, here God has caused some book. Now based upon this big grand book here, 
and it's helped thousands, but that's what it's never gotten inside of you. You're just postponing it. Now let me tell you something. It may be that you'll postpone it, so never read it. A woman called me to her home one time, a uh, middle-aged woman. Well, past, past middle-aged, her husband had retired his anymore, but uh, that's, anyhow, he'd retired. And she said, you see these books, Brother Tozer, she said, these books, the wall seems to me, as I recall, is pretty well covered with books. She said, my husband said, when I retire, i to read. But she said he retired and died. And these are the books. He didn't get to read them. We say, we Christians, tomorrow I'm going to catch up on that. I'm going to read that book. Or we say, tomorrow I'm going to start the habit of daily. Now I know I should be a daily Bible reader. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to start that. And you hear a good sermon, you hear a good hymn, son. You say, I've got to get back to reading my Bible, or I've got to begin. And uh, you say, I'm going to do it, but you don't do it. A little snack here, a little snack there, or you read a book of daily devotions, treated digested for you by somebody else, or a word box and pull out a text somebody rolled up, and that's your Bible for the day. But you say, oh, this is only temporary, I'm going to get it done. But it's been years now, and still you haven't read through your Bible. And if you have, you haven't read through it twice or times. Everybody by the time he's been a Christian four or five years should have read the Bible through more than once, and they should have read parts of it through with long and great care. And you mean to do it, but you haven't done it, and I'm not scolding, I'm just telling you. That's the way we And uh, so the affairs of this life and the cares of living, they, uh, they come and uh, the hearts go in darkness, and we, my dear old father used to say he didn't read his Bible. He got converted later on, as I told you the other night. But he didn't read his Bible, and he used to dismiss it with a shrug of his shoulder. He said, a little given, a little required. Now, where he heard that, I, that was, I suppose, a compendium of some teaching in the Bible, that if you didn't know much, you wouldn't be judged as severely. But to uh, him, little given, little required, didn't mean that uh, you were to sit down on your hands and sit there for the rest of your life. There's the band, though, and you can get more light, and you can find out. Well, and somebody else says, now, I'm going to pray. As it is now, I just pray when I'm scared and pray before meals and mumble before I go to bed. But uh, start really praying. I'm going to take time out. And uh, I'll tell you this, friends. Now, now you get me, and don't come in and ask me if I meant it. I, uh, I meant that if you don't learn to pray every day, yourself, by yourself, you'll never get very far in the kingdom of God. Never. Now, you say, but I have family prayer, but that isn't enough. You're reading, but that isn't enough. You say, I pray in church on Sunday, but that isn't enough. When thou hast entered into thy closet and door, pray unto thy Father which is in secret. And if you haven't been doing that, that may be one getting nowhere in your Christian life. We have to learn the habit of daily prayer. One man prayed five times. David said, morning, noon, and night, I will raise my voice to the Lord. I'm not setting times for you. But I am telling you, you'll have, to, you'll have to have a place to pray where nobody's hearing you. Because when people hear us, we tend to edit our prayers to suit the company we're in. We're talking to God, brother and sister. The Greeks used to say, if there's ever a time a man's honest, it's when he appears before the gods. And if they how much more Christians ought to know that if there's ever a time when we're honest, it's when we're in the presence of God alone. It's to God alone that you couldn't possibly say in the presence of your husband or wife. So if you don't learn to pray, come every day. Some people it's not a lot, and with some people it isn't so much, but some every day. Pray that take you, you feel you've gotten through. Your life is going to be a rather ragged life. There'll be a little bit of fruit, you know. You can get a little here and there. But if you're going to drink deep of the fountains of God, you're going to have to spend some time in prayer. And they're not, you can't put that tomorrow or next day or next day. You're going to have to start it now. And uh, then there are a lot of good Christians that never show up at prayer meetings at all. Never. There are a chance of banquet. Everybody will be there. 
You announce prayer meeting, there'll only be a few. I walked into a great church, had 1,200 members. That is, I just walked in as I walked by and looked around and I saw the janitor. janitor they are too cultured, they called him something else. And uh, I said to the janitor, uh, he was getting ready for the Wednesday night meetings. Wednesday night meeting, and they met at 6.30 o'clock and had a lunch. By 8 o'clock, they had their supper over with, and then they had a prayer meeting. And I said, uh, how many at Wednesday night meeting? Well, he said, I washed 300 plates last week. And I said, how many stayed for prayer meeting last week? 12 stayed. The other 288 remembered appointments they had somewhere else. They weren't prayer meetings. And you can tell the power of a church by the number of people who attend the prayer meeting, no question about it. And, well, I know I should, Brother Tozer, and I'm going to next week. But next week comes around, and just when you turns up. But if you were as bent on going to prayer meetings, you are on going to work. It wouldn't turn up, or if it did, you'd turn it. Suppose that uh, your child is on her, his or her way to school. Suppose it's ten minutes of nine, and it's within for the bell to ring. And uh, something turns up. That child doesn't doesn't uh, say, well, I won't go today. I'll give that child goes. Suppose you're on your way to work, and something turns up. Unless it's a great crisis, like an accident, or something. you don't pay attention to it. You go. You say, I'll take care of that tonight. Nothing keeps you away from work, and nothing keeps you away from Almost anything will keep us away from prayer meeting. For the simple reason, we're looking for a dodge. A place to hide, and we say, now next week I'll start. And if everybody that intended to go to prayer meeting next week went, they're able to hold them. But they don't. A few old faithful, the, 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 the hard core, as they say, the new kids, they're always there. And I've been at prayer meetings, and I wondered why they went, but they do. They go. But the rest of us say, next week, but we don't do it. And so that beast eats up your tomorrows, and your tomorrows, and your tomorrows, and your falling victims, man fell victim too. You're falling victim to postponement. You're saying it's a good thing and I'm for it. And you're not going to know you're right about it. And I'm going to do it. But chances are you won't. Then somebody else says, well, now I've been careless with my which has suffered and the missionary cause has suffered. But uh, then I've had to put my children through school and decide that uh, things haven't gone so good. But uh, I'm going to start tithing. And then in addition to that, I'm going to start giving extra... I'm going to do that. Well, next, next new year we're going to do it. But next year you don't do it. If you remember, you've been saying that same thing for a long time. Oh, the taxes are so high. Remember the time when everybody thought it was a terrible thing for the Lord to demand a tenth? And then on 30 percent, and nobody dares say a word about it. The boy with the whiskers and the star-spangled hat will get you if you don't pay. But God is so very patient, he lets you get by. And so we get by because he lets us get by. But there's a judgment seat. At the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to have to tell him why we postponed what we know we should be doing. Now, I didn't tithing or not. We had an article in the Alliance Witness about tithing, and I've had letters shot to me from all over disagreeing with it. And some agree I believe in tithing, and some saying we ought to more than tithe. The point isn't that you get under law or bondage. The point is that you be a giver in the work of God. And that you're as generous with God as you are with your family. But that a certain amount is set aside for the work of the Lord. I know a man in the city of Chicago, a good friend of mine. You see his stuff and don't know it, as you don't know him. But if you ever see anything with J. Francis Chase on it, you'll know any pictures I mean. My friend J. Francis Chase, a great Christian, great Christian. And uh, he drove up in a new automobile one day. And uh, I spoke about it, of course I would. And he said, I, I want to tell you one thing, Pastor. He said, I never buy a new car, got as much as the car cost. He said, I'm not going to be running around, riding around at God's expense. I like that expression. He's going to cheat on the giving to buy a car. 
So he said, if you ever see me in a new car, you can be no, you can know I've given that much to I like it. Maybe you can't do that, and I'm not saying that's a rule for everybody, but I'm saying that kind of our heart ought to be in everybody. And that we say I'm going to start giving why some pseudo-crisis comes up. Junior has to have braces on his teeth, you know. Here our old wife's arches fall and has to have spatial shoes. And so it finally turns out the Lord does all. Over in the city, or the eastern city, a fellow had four dollars and a half in his pocket, and the missionary offering was being taken, and he put that money in the offering, and he said to himself, oh, I need that money. He said, I'm afraid I can't do that. So he took saddle and went out without putting it in the basket. And he walked home, and on his way home, somebody held him up and took the four dollars and a half. And he said, if God doesn't get it, the devil will. So he said, from now on, if I get an impulse to give, I'm going to give. I hope he learned his lesson. Well, then we say, I'm going to speak to that lost man, that, that brother-in-law of mine. I'm going to speak to him, that, that sister. I'm going to talk to Mabel about the Lord. I really am, but you don't. You go to see them and eat and talk and premature and listen to music, but you don't talk about the Lord. You haven't. And so that lost person continues on and on. Kid, I got converted, I told you, when I was 17, from hearing a man preach on the street. And I went home and for a little push it very much. I sort of let things take their course. And one day I was up in my upstairs in my bedroom. I'd been reading the Bible. And I was living at home, of course, a boy of 17. And I... Um, Suddenly there came on me a horse. I think I know what Abraham must have suffered. And I went down in a welter of tears and darkness and pride from my mother, who wasn't converted. And I prayed, oh, God save my mother. And I was so tender that I jumped off, up off my knees and I went down to the kitchen where my dear little German mother was. Sweet as honey, and she was love lovely and a, a good moral woman and so kind hearted everybody loved her. But she wasn't a Christian it was about religion. So I went downstairs and I just broke down like a baby. And I talked to my mother I, about the Lord and how grieved I was that she wasn't a Christian. She didn't get converted that night, but the next morning a lady came in. I didn't know anything about this the night before, right on the linoleum on the kitchen floor. She got my Presbyterian mother down on her knees, and mother was... And after that, I'd go home, and I'd see a pair of old-fashioned glasses and a big print New Testament. I'd been reading her New Testament. So mother died and went to glory, and I think she went there. As far as any human thing is concerned, I was faithful to speak to her. I like to think my mother labored to bring me into the world, and then God turned around to bring her into the kingdom. I like to look at it that way. Anyhow, I take no credit. It was the Holy Ghost. He did it, but he had to have yield to him. Well, each day we live in anticipation of the next, and we say, in the, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll go see that friend. We don't write it, and so our service doesn't get done. The kingdom of God suffers, the lost remain saved, and uh, still there's that pressure on us which is not being obeyed. And there's the Christian desiring victory. Oh, how many of God's people want victory? You announce you're going to preach on the victorious life, and immediately your church will be filled here, people, to your people, 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 victorious life. Everybody wants victory, everybody wants power, everybody wants the deeper life. And uh, we say tomorrow, I'll care of this, tomorrow. But tomorrow comes and goes. We say, well, next week, next week comes and goes. We say, I'll get to Kent, come back, and passes, and we haven't done anything. Don't, we don't take time out. You have to take time out. If you want to paint your house, you have to take time out to paint your house. And if you want to wife a dress, she's not a professional dressmaker, but she makes dresses for her. We have 17 grandchildren, one daughter. And she makes dresses and all just a full tour. If you're going out there, he has take this and some package of dress and send him to somebody. Well, take the dress. You don't just wave your hand and say abracadabra and the dress falls into place. You've got to cut it out and stitch it and measure it and do all that stuff. 
I stay away from that all I can, but my wife loves it. Well, you got to be holy, we sing. And if you're going to serve God, you're going to give time to God, and I'm telling you that. Don't imagine that by grace, sure you are, and as I said the other night, nobody ever went any other way. But grace takes time, and the cultivation of the spirit time. You're going to have to do something about it over in the city of Tinplate, the town of Tinplate, West Virginia. Isn't that a strange name for town? I knew a great big, tall, good-looking fellow there some years back, great big, handsome, blonde fellow who was a coal miner, a real Christian. And he was seeking God. He was really seeking God. He was a seeker as well as a finder. And one day he said, one morning he said to his wife, you know, I feel, maybe it was evening he said it, we'd have, we're having meetings on the church, the little tin plate church. And he said, uh, do you know that I feel that things are so bad, conditions so bad, I ought to take it with God all day. Well, she said, all right, if you want to do it. He was a coal miner, so he didn't sh show up that morning, the coal mines. Spent all day with God. Never left his presence, as far as I know, all the day long. But I don't know what happened that day. But I know this coal miner living, as coal miners do, man to mouth, in the family there, dared to take a day off that he might wait on God. Looked like a fanatical thing to do, but he did. Next morning, he got up, went to work, he worked out on what they call a tipple. Now, I don't know whether you know what a tipple is. This is flat land, not any coal mines, but a tipple is where there's an opening to a mine and a track comes down. And the coal comes out of the hill and the is heavy pulls the empty back and so it goes all day long. Emptied into, into coal. And this fellow worked on the tipple outside. I said he was a miner, and he was, but he was that day to work on the tipple outside. And there were wooden cars, old cars. And he was working there and a car jumped the track and splintered and caught him and one of the long splinters ran through his thigh. Great, big, good-looking, well-built, handsome fellow. And that went through his style like a butcher knife. It was on the slag heap and bled to death. But you know, the last day he spent it in the presence of God, praying for revival and blessing to a dead town. Do you suppose now he's... Do you suppose where he is there in the presence of his Lord every once in a while he puts his head in his hands and says, ah, oh, it was to take that day out. I should have stayed in there and worked and earned a little more money. I don't think he's ever thought of that. I think he thanks God. Thank God, no, I know I did, and all of his friends did, that he dared to take some time out. You've got to give time to God. Don't. We just intend to. We say, well, I'm going to. I, I believe you, brother. I am going to, but you don't. So we postpone living and don't live with just today. Somebody else has to write a letter. Now, some of you will never get victory until you write a letter to some people. Writing uh, to somebody that, you, that, that you've had a fuss with is something that sometimes has to be done. I've seen that work wonders. I've had a fallout with my sister. Do you suppose that's what's holding me back? She jumped up and sat down, wrote the letter, and got back on her knees and got blessed. Yes. Yeah. said, tomorrow I'll write that letter, but you haven't, uh, you haven't, uh, written it. Tomorrow I'll establish family prayer. I'll establish family prayer when I get on my new hours. The new hours come and go and you don't have family prayer. You mumble a table. Get up with your family prayer. Well, I'll be reconciled to that enemy. I'll do that. I'll do that act of kindness. What a, what a world we're living in. What a, a mean, vicious world we're living in. If you don't think the world is mean, just drive your car over here and spend ten seconds after the, after the light and see how many people swear at you with their horns behind you. You know, you can swear with a horn. I've heard the obscene language by, by your horn. Well, the world is, is, is it's a mean world. It's a sinful world. It's here to do kind things for people. And I recommend that you start doing kind things for people now because you won't be around for a generation. I said the other night, David served his generation by the will of God before he fell on sleep, and no man has any right to fall to serve his generation. You can't serve the generation that's past 
You can't, except indirectly, serve the generation to come, but you can present generation. Man said to the uh, little boy, maybe five, six, we'll say, and that little boy was always uh, begging him to help him build a shack. He wanted to build a hut, build a hut in the backyard. His father was always tired. He said, no, not tonight. So the next night he'd come home, Daddy, will you help tonight? He wanted his father to go out and help him to drag a few boards from here and there and put them together and nail them up and put some second-hand tar paper over them and have a hut. Now, what he would want to know, what we grown-ups don't understand, but a seven-year-old boy knows up to him. He wanted that hut, but couldn't quite make it himself. Father said, I'll do it, son. One of these times, I'll do it. I'll do it. But he didn't. I'll do it. Then one day he said, he came home, and the boy said, Daddy, will you help me build my hut tonight? He said, listen, son, I'm awfully tired of if you will put it off till tomorrow night, I'll even buy new lumber and we'll buy, we'll make it out of new lumber and I'll help you build your hut. So the little fellow went off to bed with his face shining. He was going to have his hut built out of new lumber. At 10 o'clock the next morning, this businessman, father, got a call to the hospital. Your boy's been hurt. On his way to school, he'd been hit by a truck. He got in there and found a little crushed white form dead. He recognized his father, but he couldn't talk much. And the father put his ear down and he was whispering to him. The father put his ear down and the lad said, Well, Daddy, we didn't get her hut built, did we? And that man said, Oh, God, if I could have him just one day. If I could have him back just one evening. He said, no matter how tired, no matter I helped him build that hut, but I put it off and I put it off and I put it off. Back. All he'll have is the memory of a kind deed postponed. There are others who are waiting for that kind deed, maybe not insistently asking for it, but they're waiting for it. You haven't done it. You meant to, and you're good-hearted, you intend to, but you haven't done it. And so you're falling into the trap of postponed, postponed kindness. And I would address myself to the backslider and say to you, the Lord said you words and come home, and God will be unto you and love you freely for his angers. You intend to do it, but you haven't done it. So you're postponing your return. But you remember what the prodigal son said? Arise and go. But he didn't say, tomorrow I will arise and go. He said, I will arise. The Holy Ghost adds, so he arose and went. There's only one way to make good on an intention, and that is to turn it into an act. And there is the lost soul. The lost soul... The Lord pauses beside that lost soul and offers him forgiveness and cleansing and deliverance and life. Angry, he says, go thy way tomorrow, later, some other time, I will, at a more convenient season. But he doesn't. Tomorrow I will stop that evil life. Tomorrow I will turn from that wicked thing that I'm doing that I know grieves God, but he doesn't. Tomorrow I'll confess more, but he doesn't. Tomorrow I'll make a public confession of Christ in the church. I'll go to the front and I'll I want to become a Christian tomorrow, next week, but he doesn't do it. And so Felix was lost at last. He would be sorrow, but he perished today. And that's the history of how many tens of thousands of... I will be saved tomorrow, but he perishes today. To me, this is an awful thing. I hear a story. The marker God has put up. The marker. He's caused it to be erected. I hope we dare pass over this. Over in the state of Ohio some years ago, they adopted a little plan... They, they don't, but I happen to see this one. Used to travel through the state when they did have this custom. If anybody was killed at a cryway, they'd put up a white cross, painted, and have it there. And the little 
white cross had no, no letters on it. It just said to the wise, Now look out. One of your fellow men died here. And I once went past the corner. Five white crosses stood side by side. It was the state of Ohio trying to tell their citizens, This is a dangerous place. These five of your fellow citizens don't drive anymore. This is the marker. And I believe that God sometimes puts these stories in the Bible as, as sort of markers. White crosses are erected at the in life. And says, now look out here, because here's where men perish. I believe this story of Felix is one such a white on life's highway. Saying to all of us, now look out, that right at this bend here, this hairpin turn is where... And he perished at the hairpin turn of postponed living. Don't you fall into the same snare. People do. Felix lost that which he couldn't afford to lose. Felix had lost his job. He could afford that. He did lose it anyhow two years later. He lost his wife, Priscilla. He could have afforded that. If he'd lost his health, he could have afforded that. If he'd lost his life itself, he could have afforded that. We've all got to die. But that which no man can afford to lose, Felix lost his soul. No man can afford to lose his soul. That precious treasure, we say, tomorrow, 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 and tomorrow. What are you going to do? Are you going to live today, or are you going to postpone your living till tomorrow, never live? Are you going to get it right today, or are you going to postpone it and never get it right? Are you going to seek the Holy Ghost to seek it itself and be filled with the Spirit now, or are you going to postpone it and never be filled with the Spirit? Are you going to seek to be victorious in your Christian life, or are you going to say, well, tomorrow, next week, or I'll talk to my pastor about it. That postpones it. So maybe you'll never end it. Well, it's up to you, my dear friends. That's my message. And I pray that the Holy Ghost may take it. And you... We're going to sing. And listen, here's what we want to do tonight. A little prayer. I'd like to pray with you. If you'd like to be prayed with about anything, I and Pastor Conway and this other pastor down here, I'm sure we're willing to come. I'd be willing. We'll meet. Our friend the chairman says that there's a place back here, stage back here with chairs where we can kneel. So we close this conference with some decisions, some real decisions. This year or next week or tomorrow, say, God help me tonight. Whatever the need is, you want someone to pray with you, and you don't care who knows it. You're bold. You want to say, I want God worse than I don't care what people think about me. So you're going to come for any need right through that door and up the stairs. And you can see, you will see there, there'll be somebody there to help you. And we will have a little prayer together tonight at the conference. All right, what number was that? 57. Number 57. Let us stand. Our brother will lead us in singing number 57. Trust him. And uh, you come.
and tender beyond all the scripts, ready to receive you. And let nothing prevent you from coming, nothing, for you will find the most gracious, the most cordial Lord that ever you could imagine, if you have a need while we sing.